wine, music, you know, the color of a wall, the smell of a flower, um, the weather, you know, I just want this quiet beauty. Um, and I think that if there's something magical about wine, it's that as winemakers, we can, we can find that. Welcome to the Organic Wine Podcast. Hi, from South Central Los Angeles, this is Adam Huss, and my guest for this podcast is Laura Brennan Bissell. Laura is the owner of and winemaker for Inconu, and that's spelled I N C O N N U. She built her career in Kanu and a new project in the Columbia Gorge by following her curiosity, her drive to find an occupation that allowed her to express her innate creativity, and all while being guided by her love of wine. As you'll hear, Laura is beautifully articulate about some of the most important aspects of wine, its ability to inspire and encapsulate our love of life and its sensual magic that somehow transcends the senses. But these aren't romantic notions to her. They give wine its depth, and she's quick to emphasize the respect and patience that great wine demands. If you have the soul of an artist, if you are a free spirit, if you learn by doing, and if you are driven to create something beautiful and good, then you will definitely enjoy getting to know Laura. She's as much muse as winemaker, and you'll find yourself equal parts inspired and enchanted. Just a heads up. There was a bit of an audio delay in our connection, so at times we talk over each other or there are odd pauses. It's not terrible, but you may notice it in places. As always, thanks for listening. Enjoy. Hi, Laura. Thanks so much for doing this. Welcome. Thanks, Adam. It's uh, it's a pleasure. <laughs> um, you are right now in Washington State. Correct. And that's kind of a new move for you, right? Yep. We moved up. In the last um, couple of years? Yeah, well, I moved, we moved up here officially last October, so we've been here for a year. Um, for the year prior to that, okay. I was traveling back and forth very frequently, trying to get things established up here. Got so, it. Okay. Yeah, and we're in Washington, but we're, just for a geographical point, we are directly across from Hood River, Oregon. We're on the Columbia River, so we're the Columbia Gorge AVA. Nice. Um, And we're an hour from Portland. So frequently when people hear Columbia River, Gorge, whatever, they think that we're like more up into Washington, but we're not. We're like right across from Oregon. And is the, is the Columbia, does the, does that AVA span both sides of the river? Correct. I believe it's the only AVA in the United States that's two states. I think that's correct. Except for Walla Walla. Is Walla Walla two states? What about Walla Walla? Isn't Walla Walla just yeah. Washington? Yeah, it's Oregon. No, really? No, it also dips. Yeah, well, like the Milton Freewater District is part of Walla huh. Walla, and that's definitely in Oregon. All right, well, I am totally wrong then. For some reason, I thought that was the case. <laughs> well, at least uh, it, it seems like it only happens no, in like, the Washington-Oregon border. I am, I am fact-checking you right now. <laughs> <laughs> All right, do it, do it. And it looks, it looks like the proper AVA of Walla Walla, or the town of Walla Walla, is all. The town Washington. definitely is in okay, Washington. But, all right, okay, hold on. I'm, I'm just curious. Um, do it. I need. That's what I need. That's gonna when this podcast finally makes oh, yeah, money right. and <laughs> yeah. I can afford. I can afford a staff. My first hire is going to be a fact checker who uh-huh. is just going to be <laughs> <You're> just gonna <laughs> constantly take, take somebody from this American life or something. <laughs> That's um, right. Yeah. You're right. Yeah. Milton Freewater <laughs> is on the Oregon side. Um, maybe it's that Washington and Oregon are the only states that share ABS. I don't, I don't know. Like it's misinformation. I, I was given at some point, but hey. Yeah. Now we both know. I still think you're special. Oh, thank you, Adam. (laughs) (laughs) I I um I love being wrong because it means you get to learn something, and now I know. (laughs) Um, well, you didn't start your wine career in that area in the Columbia River area. Um, Yes, and and you also didn't start your life. You started that down in the bay area if i'm if i'm correct nope the bay I, area of california that i am 
No, I am not from California. <laughs> um, no, no, no. I, oh, I know you, you're not from California. The, did your wine career, your wine career started in that area though, right? In the Bay Area? Technically. Well, no, I mean, technically my wine career started, like the first real wine job I had was at uh, Unti in Dry Creek Valley, um, you know, outside of the town of Healdsburg. Oh, okay. Um, my wine interest started when I lived in the Bay Area. I mean, I was interested in wine, I would say, from a very young age, but I had no ability to, like, accumulate information about wine or become, a you know, a wine-centered person. Um, and then I, you know, made Just a more the drinking aspect. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, pretty un, <laughs> uninformed drinking. Um, but it wasn't until <laughs> I lived, I lived in Barcelona when I got like really, really, really into wine and then moved back to California to, to do an internship. Nice. All right. What, is that what brought you to California, an internship in wine? No. Um, I had lived in California before I lived in Spain. Um, what brought me to okay. California was I just, you know, I was, uh, looking for a different life. And, uh, I mean, the first, the first time I came here, um, or there, uh, was with the option to do like a tattoo apprenticeship with a friend of mine at the time. And I mean, I did that for all of two or three months and then I just worked in bars and restaurants and, you know, rode my bike a lot and went to a lot of shows. Um, and just enjoyed, um, for all intents and purposes, you know, a, a small part of my early twenties. Um, you know, living living the Oakland, San Francisco, Bay Area life at that time, which was very different than what it is now. So, yeah. Nice. Yeah. Was, I came out. I moved did, here when I was 22, I believe. Um, to California? Yes. Uh, and then... And? Went, you know, kind of just hung out basically, <laughs> um, you know, and, and, uh, uh -huh. and, and met, met a winemaker, um, at a, at a beer bar I used to work at. And that was the first time it really hit me that you could just be a winemaker. Like that was, you know, not in the, in the, um, in the like, uh, Rolodex of, of job options that I had ever been presented with, you know, kind of like equestrian or, um, or, you know, interior designer were all things that I was just like, well, I'll, I'll never be that, you know, I won't even think about it. But, um, yeah, I met a winemaker and, uh, we clicked and I learned, you know, it was like the, the first, the first person I met in that field. And, um, you know, I went up after I had gotten off work, he was young and handsome and I sat down next to him and introduced myself and we started talking and he, ended up being a kosher winemaker as well. He was like an orthodox kosher winemaker. And this was the day after Passover. And um, yeah, we became friends. And I learned, you know, the, that was like the first person I met where I actually like learned about wine from him. Um, and, you know, I learned about Tanat and I learned about the Northern Rhone and the Southern Rhone and, you know, drank probably, you know, the first like really good wines I had gotten to, to drink and, it was an obsession from then mm. on. You know, I remember, I remember, you know, the first uh, Gaio and the first, you know, like wine I drank from. Uh, I, I, it's it's so funny to to think about it now, but it was like a Gigondas was like the first wine that I was just like, oh, what is this? You know. Um, <laughs> Yeah. Hey, that's a good wine. I mean, oh, a good Gigondas right is incredible. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. This was a uh, one that I, I'm blanking yeah. on the name of the house, but it's one that Charles Neal brings in. And it was right in that $20 mark where that was a whole lot of money for me to spend on a bottle of wine at that time. But it was a really good bottle of wine for me. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, How much did you buy? Just one bottle? No, I mean, you know, I would try, you'd try and, you know, save up my shekels and go back and, you know, buy, buy more bottles, but, it, but I was also trying to learn. So I wasn't, you know, buying the same bottle of wine over and over again. I, you know, I would try right. something from Lorac because once I got interested in wine through my friend, Jonathan, um, there was a little wine shop in Oakland that I'd go to called Vino on, uh, Piedmont Avenue. Um, and there, he would, there was this one guy who worked there named Perry and he was like the only person in any, fancy wine shop who was nice to me. I mean, I, you know, 
I went into all these other shops that now sell my wine. But at that time, you know, I would get looked at like I was going to steal wine and they'd be like, the $10 bottles are at the front, you know. Um, but this guy, Perry, <laughs> <laughs> he, um, you know, he noticed that I was like coming in and kind of like systematically drinking through the Southern Rhone, you know, and buying the wines from the Northern Rhone that I could afford. And he started talking to me about it and telling me, you know, which wines were the better buys and which I would really like. And, you know, through him and Jonathan, I really got my first kind of like introduction into into what fine wine was and, you know, small producer wine and, you know, coincidentally, low intervention wine to a certain degree at that point. Um, you know, obviously not crazy natural wine, but just, you know, real, real wine, you know, a lot of stuff from Kermit Lynch. And, yeah. Charles Neal and Bone Imports and, you know, kind of the classics from that you find in the Bay Area. Right. Yeah. So what was the transition then? Where did you, where did, where did that interest take you? How, where did the path lead you at that point? Um, I mean, it's, it's kind of like a crazy winding path, but from there, let's see, I, um, not long after that, I was riding my bike to like one of my four jobs in the Bay Area. Um, and I was hit by a car. Um, it was a van. It was a San Francisco mobile patrol van. Wow. Um, and they like they got me pretty good. And you know, I was riding a track bike at the time and they ruined my bike and my shoulder. And uh at that moment, a gentleman walked up to me and said, I saw everything, and I was like, Well, thank God. And then he handed me his business card and it said Eric Rappaport, San Francisco District Attorney. And I was like, Yes. <laughs> um, because <laughs> having wow. having had been a you know a, a bike messenger in my early days along with a million other you know bottom tier jobs, I had been hit by a car a few times and had people do things like come and make sure I wasn't dead and drive away or you know like talk to attorneys and be able to get nowhere, but at this point I was like, okay, I will at least be paid for my injuries and my broken bike. Um and right. yeah, so I, when I, this is kind of like here nor there, but when I was very young, like before I dropped out of high school, um, I worked for an attorney as like a paralegal. Um, I had wanted to be a lawyer when I was much younger and I had been offered to read the law in Virginia. Um, so I was, you know, working for a lawyer. I was familiar with writing motions and whatnot and filling out, you know, some legal paperwork, even though paperwork is basically my biggest nightmare, but I was able to fill out my own, um, you know, complaint and filed against the city. And they settled with me like really quickly, actually. Um, you know, I wasn't trying to get a ton of money. I just wanted to pay my medical bills, fix my bike and have some extra cash. Um, so they settled with me, I think for like 18,000 bucks and, you know, it left me with like $5,000, which was more money than I'd ever had. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> so I decided to go travel and I, um, I booked like a, a trip and went to Southeast Asia. So I did like Thailand, Laos and Cambodia. And then I went into Nepal for a couple of months and down into India and, you know, did the Annapurna circuit and like did all these things that like I had for like where I was in life and what my life was and, you know, what my capacity was and, you know, what my privilege was at that point was not the person who got to go do the Annapurna circuit or, you know, backpack through India or anything like that. Mm. I just happened to be hit by a car and the person who happened to see it happened to be honest and also happened to be a lawyer for the same city of the person, you know, of the person driving the vehicle. Um, and, you know, instead of, you know, blowing it all, you know, partying with my friends, which could have happened when I was younger, I, you know, I had a roommate at the time. I lived in a warehouse in West Oakland um, who had traveled some. And, you know, he and I, it's funny, we never really got along. And when I was trying to figure out what to do, and I think it's probably just because I was an annoying 22-year-old, you know, who played my music too loud and was disrespectful and lived in a warehouse with a bunch of older people. Um, but when that happened, he um, <laughs> he was like, you should travel. And I was like, huh. <laughs> I should travel. You know, I'd always <laughs> wanted to do it. I had gotten a passport, but I'd never left the country. And I just, I did it, <laughs> you know. It was it was wonderful advice. And that trip changed my life. And, you know, kind of throughout my whole life, I've always enjoyed writing. And uh, on that trip, I wrote these little, like, kind of vignette stories, you know, about what I was doing and who I was with. And, you know, 
and they were, I, you know, they were pretty funny and interesting because um, I was in interesting places. And, you know, I think because I had come from such like, you know, honestly, a bit of a polarizing background. I mean, interest is interest not included, but, you know, my my life up until that point was n- not a charmed experience. Um, you know, it was, it was hard for me, uh, to, to travel by myself, but it was really good. You know, I had to, I had to learn how to communicate with other people who, you know, had completely different backgrounds than me. I had to learn how to become friends with pretty much anybody. Um, and, and it was a wonderful experience. Um, and yeah. So from those stories, I was offered a job in PR and marketing in the bicycle industry. Um, I'd always been really into bikes. Um, so it was, it was a good fit for me. Um, and I took, you know, I, I, I had to like Google what PR and marketing were. Um, but I took, I took the job, <laughs> how, you know, sorry. How did you get your, how did you get your stories out into the world? What did you do with them? Oh, I like posted them on MySpace and, you know, sent them in emails. Oh, okay. Yeah. Nice. So, I mean, I, you know, I wasn't even capable of making a blog at that point, you know, like it, it had, had I had I had I made a blog, I mean, maybe <laughs> maybe it would have been more fortuitous for me. But no, I did. You know, I just sent them to my friends and the guy who yeah. the guy who um, owned the PR and marketing bicycle company was uh, was a friend of mine and, you know, just kind of a casual acquaintance. And um, yeah. And uh, he, he just he, saw some talent and. Yeah. 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 I think he just thought I was good at telling stories and, you know, or communicating through words. And, uh, yeah, so that, that was like my, my first, um, you know, entry into any sort of credible job, you know, that required some, some skill. Um, and then nice. from there, I, uh, let's see, I did that for about a year. Um, maybe a little longer. And at the same time, I had started like a, my own little kind of nonprofit through that called Art Bike, where, you know, at these big events that we'd be promoting or, you know, running the press office for, I'd put on like a bike and art collaboration. And, you know, usually with like a big party and just kind of like a community building event. Um, and yeah, I mean, that, that, that was a good experience. And I, Basically, though I was having fun doing that, realized there was no future in it, um, you know, as far as like having the satisfaction that I think I need in life and, um, you know, the financial security. I mean, because basically I was just living in poverty, but like glorified poverty. Um, and, uh, you know, I was, I was touring with my friend's black metal band at the same time too, just to make some extra cash and get to see the country, which was also a good experience. Um, but yeah, I, I still just, I hit a point where I was like, I need to, I need to learn more about something more complicated and interest, interesting. And, you know, to me that was wine. Um, so I like very haphazardly decided that I was going to fly to Barcelona and ride my bike into France and, you know, find a a winery that would let me intern with them and pick grapes and all that stuff. Um, and I got to Barcelona with my bicycle and had a lot less money than I should have had, you know, in my plans. And, you know, I had a couple thousand bucks and was supposed to be in (laughs) Europe for like four months. And, you know, the cold, hard reality that Europe wasn't as cheap as, you know, Cambodia (laughs) set in really quick. And, um, (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, so I ended up just kind of like flailing in Barcelona for a couple of weeks and found my footing. And yeah, I just, you know, I had a, a boyfriend slash fiance there for a while who was also really into to good food and good wine. And, you know, he and I explored a lot of the culinary scene of Catalonia. And um, I created a job teaching English <laughs> in La Bocaria to chefs and <laughs> Basically, you know, like sat at Pinocho and ate chuchos and drank cortados in the morning or, you know, hung over Capipota and talked about food and wine and walked around the market. And it's funny. I mean, I am terrible at languages. I'm I'm just kind of like a overall like dyslexic person. And that makes learning languages and, you know, doing spreadsheets and all all things that are that side of the brain very complicated. But I can tell you the name of tons of mushrooms in Catalan. <laughs> 
you know, um, and fish, you know, That's awesome. and, and, and odd vegetables, you know, heirloom beans. Um, but, uh, <laughs> yeah, it, uh, it, it, it was just, you know, again, you know, he, he, my, my, my fiance at the time and I, you know, granted, I think it was one of the most intellectually stimulating and fascinating and wonderful times of my life and relationships I ever had. I imagine when you came back, it, you were sort of uh, aflame with new ideas about how making your life something like that. You mean when I came back to the States? To the States, yeah. Uh, well, I mean, I came yeah. back to the States to learn to make wine. Like I was undocumented in Europe Got and it. I maybe could have found something, but, uh, in, you know, I, I had been like, I, like I, I had made a friend with a woman who ran a wine shop near me who was like super into like really, really natural wine. And she was very, very, very intelligent and an excellent taster. And, you know, we became, we became good buddies and, uh, <coughs> um, I told her that I was, you know, I decided I wanted to learn to make wine and then I was going to move back to California and find an internship, you know, to which she told me that I was absolutely fucking crazy. Um, you know, that I had no experience and that nobody was going to give me a job. And sure enough, a few people wrote me back and, you know, seemed interested in giving me jobs um, what, to, to a resume that was 100% bogus. And, you know, anybody who knew anything <laughs> about wine, I should like, I should like, frame that resume and put it on my office wall one day. <laughs> it was so bad. <laughs> and uh yeah, I uh I, I don't know. I, I think people just thought it was interesting maybe. I mean this was back when most of the people who were doing winemaking internships were Davis students or, you know, traveling from abroad, you know, from winemaking families, etc. Like it, you know, it's 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 funny to think that, you know, only ten years ago it was like it was a very different scene, you know. Um, there were, there, you know, there obviously yeah. were people who didn't have. How has it changed? I mean, I think that now it's like, and anybody wants to go learn to make wine. You know, lots of people are making wine, um, and uh, and I think it's just this kind of, uh, I would say, largely like idealist social media driven entre like micro entrepreneur aspirational thing that just has taken every single human being on the planet right now. Um, and Oh, interesting. And okay. I, and, and yeah. I think that it's like, it's great. If you want to learn to make wine, you should learn to make wine, but it's like it, it's not like you learn to make wine and then instantly you're a winemaker and you get to, you know, to reap the benefits of that. I mean, not that you know you are you will you will be a winemaker if you make wine that that's what you are but there's so much more to it and it's a lot of grit um that's required i think to actually make it as a winemaker um in patience um and and it's funny because i think that the thing that brings a lot of people into wine right now is is you know an idealization that comes from, you know, everything being visible and people get to look at what winemakers lives look like on Instagram. And they're like, Oh, that looks nice. You know, but you don't see the other side of it. And you don't understand that it's not this instantaneous thing where the square picture just pops up a screen on a screen of something beautiful. And that's a winemaker's life. It's like, no, there's like 10 years that probably go into making that picture happen or you know five years that grow into growing that vine or you know who who knows like what yeah. the idealization is or 18 months that go into aging the wine that you know you see the picture of you know plus tons of hours of trying to understand the financials of all of that and you know and and i just think yep. that it's like th that w where we are you know fashion everything like that it it makes sense um you know, to be monetized and marketed and, and spread rampantly and rapidly. But wine, I think, is like the antithesis of that. You know, it's yeah. this thing, you know, you, there's young wine that you drink fast and it's fun and I get that and I like that. But there's also this like long intentional process of learning, you know, and trying to make something yeah. the right way, you know, like even getting to know a vineyard, it's like, it's like a person. I mean, it takes years to really understand a vineyard and, and how the grapes are going to respond to you and how they'll respond to the vintage. And, 
you know, in, in, in all of these other variables. It's not just fast. Yes. There's nothing fast about it. Even fast wines to make them well require skill. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, right. It's that whole like uh, a 10 year overnight success kind of idea. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, <laughs> I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, it, it is really something that, you know, I've been making wine at a small level for years, but even just moving to a bigger level where I'm trying to make things naturally. I think that's the other thing. When you add in wanting to make natural wines, your intentionality in the vineyard, your your knowledge of the vineyard has to increase because that's really your only control, you know, is when you pick the grapes and how well they're grown. You know, I don't, what kind of I you know. so I I'm not um a what people would have called natural wine 10 years ago. I would say I could fall into that. Um, the kind of extreme policing of what the term natural wine means now, I want nothing to do with. <laughs> so, I mean, yes, like controlling how I grow. <laughs> no, that's my, good. Yeah. Controlling how I grow my grapes. I, 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 and I didn't mean to. No, I, I'm, not, I'm not taking any offense to it at all. I just feel like it's something that I should articulate. Um, I'm I'm not offended. Yeah, no, I'm never and I didn't mean to imply that when somebody who loves wine calls my wine natural wine, as long as they also are drinking good wine and not just like mousy garbage that's volatile and disgusting. And then they're like, "Her wines are natural wine," and I'm like, <laughs> "What did I yeah. do? How did I fuck up that wine?" Um, you know, I just um, yeah. The the term has no, and I didn't even mean to imply that you were making natural wines. I I just you know just talking about that need to to know the vineyard becomes even more extreme when you, you know, when you have, when you remove some of the tools that you could play with in the, in the winery. Um, I love sulfur. But yeah, go on. I would love to hear. I, I love sulfur. I think yeah. It's great. Hey. <laughs> I don't use, I don't use much of it. I mean, but that's, you know, that's after learning, you know, you don't need to. You yeah. don't, well, you don't need to, if you use it correctly. I, I think that in that, that I feel right. like a lot of people, feel like, oh, you know, like I did the whole, you know, oh, only 30 parts at bottling. I mean, I think that's hilarious. Like, I think that's the absolute wrong time to put in most of the sulfur, um, you know, because you don't, <laughs> you don't know what it's going to do, A, like, unless you're mm. like a very skilled um, enologist, um, you know, who can do the math and figure out exactly what's going to stay there. Um, and most people who are talking about only using 30 parts of bottling are also not trained enologists who are doing that math. Um, or, you know, you don't have to be right. a trained enologist, but they're, they, but that's, it's, it's antithetical of the philosophy. Um, you know, sulfur is a wonderful tool for preserving things and for shutting down, you know, essentially stuff that you don't want in your wine. And if you put it all at the end, you're basically putting it all in at the end when it's going to shut everything down right before you put a fucking cork in it, which makes no sense to me. Like the job of the sulfur for me is to protect my wine while it's aging. And then when I put it into bottle and put the cork in, I want the lowest amount of free sulfur I can possibly have to bottle, you know, to bottle safely. But to have a beautiful wine that's left to age, you know, without being encumbered by trying to metabolize this like higher dose of sulfur. Um, you know, so, right. so I'm on the yeah, little, like little bit of sulfur at crush and little bit of sulfur after mallow. And if you do that appropriately, frequently, you can bottle with less than 30 parts total, you know, and, and right. anyway, like I, you know, I, the last thing I want to do is talk about sulfur. Um, but I, but I think it's, it's an interesting, you know, polarization. And then, um, the, you know, the other thing that I believe no, I as a winemaker is that my job is actually to make really good wine. It's not to participate in any sort of dogma around it. Like the only dogma, which isn't even dogmatic, because I think if you were to tell me that my vineyard was going to die overnight, if I didn't make an intervention, I wouldn't enjoy, I probably would make the intervention. Um, fortunately, it doesn't usually play out like that. But I, if I had any sort of thing that I was my soapbox in wine, as far as like nuts and bolts, it would be farming and, you know, obviously organic farming and farming with as little disruption of the soil as possible um, and farming for an ecosystem, not a monoculture. Um, you know, I, I think that yeah. anybody who is on this earth right now who is 
you know, working with the soil or in an industry adjacent to that, like most wine, wineries in California are vineyard adjacent. They're not vineyard owning or vineyard farming. And I feel like if you're not completely concerned and panicking about like what is happening to our environment, then it's like, I don't even tell me. <laughs> I don't even want to hear it. You know, like so if you can tell me you made great wine and I'll be happy to hear that and, you know, I'll taste your wine, but don't tell me that you're like doing anything good <laughs> for the environment or for people, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah, no, I, I couldn't agree more I, about the dogma. I, I feel exactly the same. I think the dogma, the, the main dogma I have is in the farming and about the same as you. I and mean, we pretty much agree completely on that. Um, now, I think we jumped ahead, though. So I just want to steer you back. How did you did you get some formal training eventually? Or did, was it all in? No, I just did a couple internships. And, and like I did, an, like that. I did an internship at Unti. Great. And then the next year, my friend Jonathan, the kosher winemaker who I stayed friends with, um, helped me make my first uh-huh. barrel of wine. Um, and basically, you know, with no, like I had no money at all and, you know, kept making excuses of why I couldn't make wine. And he, you know, bought me a half ton of grapes and gave me a barrel and let me make wine in his winery, which was incredibly kind, um, you know, and That's no excuses. Yeah, I guess. Exactly. And, um, you know, and I think that from a lot of people, I got the attitude that I had like somehow jumped the line and I was like, well, the only, like I know myself and I knew that the only way I was going to learn to make wine was if I actually made my own wine and started to understand it that way. Um, and then the following yeah. vintage, I interned with Matthias and, um, you know, primarily doing vineyard stuff and, you know, really got to understand farming and vineyards on a much deeper level and, you know, kind of went down that rabbit hole. So that's how I ended up making oh, that's, wine. So is that did that inform some of your vineyard dogma working with Matthiason? Um yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that Steve is a wonderful person to inform all types of dogma. You know, like Steve is um yeah. Steve is the person who kind of pulled me out of winemaking dogma. I mean, the first the first half or you know, half ton of wine I made, I was very like, oh, I don't want to use any sulfur and, you know, like super, super, super wooey about it. Um, thankfully, I ended up putting some sulfur in because my friend Jonathan basically was like, you're going to ruin your wine if you don't put sulfur in it. And I was like, all right, fine. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, the next year when I was making wine, you know, Steve kind of gave me a few examples of different types of wine and was like, what kind of winemaker do you want to be? <laughs> you know, and right. I wanted to be a winemaker who made wine that I would want to drink, and that's what I chose. Yeah. So yeah, I don't. Nice. You know, I've and never so inoculated. Kind of I've um, the kind of wine that I want to drink. Um, I mean, yeah. you know, I like a lot and of, that you make. Okay. Um, I like a lot of different wine. Um, you know, and that's obviously changed over time. I would say that when I was younger, I liked you know, young, fresh wine. I mean, I appreciated more intense structured wine as well, but, you know, young, fresh wine was probably what I drank the most of for economic reasons as much as, you know, consumptive levels reasons. Um, I would say, at, at you know, at this point, you know, I always tell people I like Cabinet Riesling, Longue Nebbiolo, and Grower Champagne. Like, that's like my, my instantaneous don't have to think about it answer. <laughs> Um, you know, obviously I, hey, yeah. when I can, I like to drink, you know, some more beautiful wines, you know, I, when Burgundy is accessible to me and I get to drink a good bottle of Burgundy, I love it, of course. Um, you know, sure. just like, you know, I really love some of the more traditional, like old school, like Philip Tony style, you know, Cab Sauv from California, um, but I, I think that if I were to try to summarize the type of wine that I usually like to drink, um, it would fall right into the wine that I usually like to make, um, which is I like to make wine that is not the loudest thing in the room. And I like to drink wine that is not the loudest thing in the room. Um, I think there's something that happens or has happened at least to me as I've gotten older and, you know, not that I, 
didn't always enjoy these things, but, but I wanted more diversity, I suppose. Um, but the older I get, the more I want something that's just plain good, be it food or, you know, any sort of sensory experience, wine, music, you know, the color of a wall, the smell of a flower, um, the weather, you know, I just want this quiet beauty. Um, and I think that if there's something magical about wine, it's that as winemakers, we can, we can find that in such a like sensory ample, like, 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 like a, like a, like a, just this symphonic experience for our senses, you know, the way it looks, the way it smells, the way it feels in your mouth, the way it tastes. Um, and, and I love that, you know, I guess. So for me, wine, wine has an intensity, um, you know, to me, good wine has a lot of intensity and a lot of energy, but it's tamed, you know, it's like, it's like Mm. a really, like a really powerful horse that moves like beautifully and calmly or, or, Mm. or like, um, I don't know. I, I don't know how much of a music person you are, but like, like Shostakovich, like for me, I can never, never be able to say his name with the, co- the correct intonation, but he's one of my favorite composers. Um, and, you know, I love his symphonies, but for me, my favorite, my favorite pieces by him are just, you know, like quartets and they're, they're, they're long and they're quiet and they're slow and it'll hang on the cello for, you know, 30 seconds on the same note but it's like the intensity and the vibration and the vibrance of that is it's overwhelming, but it's just one instrument. Mm. And I think that that that's what I want in anything at this point in my life is just the simplicity of, of like a 30 second moment of the closest you may be able to get in your life to perceivable perfection, which is thusness, which doesn't last. It's just enjoying a moment. And I, if I could collect as many yeah. beautiful moments as I possibly could and put them into a chamber, I would want to. And, you know, hopefully that will be what my cellar is one day. That sounds lovely. Yeah. I, I hate to bring it back to the mundane because that's poetic and beautiful. Um, I want to ask how you try to do that. Like, what are, what are you doing in the vineyard? What are you doing in the winery to, to try to achieve that? I mean, the most knee-jerk answer to that is I'm learning. <laughs> <laughs> that I Look, I think that's fantastic and more profound than people who hear that might understand, right? It's knowing that it is a constant state of learning, right? Like you are, you know, that's the expertise is learning that you're learning, I think, and to oh. some degree. So like you said, you already mentioned like how the how you have to how many years it takes to understand a vineyard and how it reacts to different things well like, i mean it said 3 years to to make to like understand making a wine from a vineyard but i think to to really understand the vineyard is just right. to be there every day and see it and you know participate yeah. in its life you know like anything else um yeah so you oh sorry go ahead oh no i mean you know i, I i'm pretty i'm as hands off as i possibly can be but when it's time to make yeah. a decision or make a move, I do it quickly and I don't beat myself up about it. I would say that's how I make wine and it's how I'm learning I farm. Um, you know, even even with livestock, you know, like I have a goat that has an abscess right now because my dog scratched it because he's big and he's a puppy and she's little and she's a kid. And, um, you know, and in trying to deal with that is... It's like, I mean, it's the same way I dealt with it when my daughter had an abscess on her finger and she was, you know, not even a year old. I did not want to give her antibiotics and I don't want to give my goat antibiotics, but I had penicillin sitting in my fridge for my daughter, just like I have penicillin sitting in my fridge for this goat. And if I'm unable to lance and clean this abscess enough so that the goat learns, you know, body learns to heal itself... And it gets to the point where it gets a fever or anything like that. And that I may kill an animal with my own stubbornness. I won't do that. I'll shoot penicillin into its leg for four days until it gets better. But, you know, I'm going to try and give it the opportunity to heal itself 
you know, through making sure it's out of the rain and it's getting enough clean water and it's eating enough alfalfa and it's like getting all the things that a little goat needs, you know, but it's like, <laughs> I, I think that a vineyard is the same thing. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's an organism. And I think that most organisms, if you yeah. give them the right environment and the right food and, and attention, you know, they will try to thrive. I mean, like the vineyards I inherited up here in Washington, I've been, you know, they were pretty sick when I got them. So it's a lot right now of just, you know, trying to give everything the opportunity to thrive, you know, the best opportunity I can give it, but culling when necessary. And I don't plan on planting until I get to an equilibrium where I feel like most of the things that are going to go on them by themselves, we've removed and most of the things that are strong enough to fight will stay, and then we'll introduce new organisms. Yeah, um, you started in Calif. You started in California, right? Mm -hmm. You started in Kanu is the name of your thing. Did I pronounce that correctly? Yeah, in Kanu. Yep. Kanu. How how long did you do that in California before you moved north? Um. So my first vintage was 2012, and then I. Okay moved up here last year, but I took over this project more formally in the winter of 2019, but started making wine from this vineyard gotcha. in the fall of 2018. Um, the people who bought the two Got properties it. up here are old friends of mine. Um, and, you know, the husband in particular um, watched me really starting Kanu out of nothing. Like I was working at a little wine bar in San Francisco. I mean, I had this aspiration of having a winery, which was nothing short of insanity at that point, you know, with my lack of money and lack of experience and lack of knowledge. Um, but I was pretty determined that I was going to do it. And again, it was, you know, one of the many situations in my life where most people were like, there's no way you're going to pull this off. And you know, Ryan, um, of Ryan and Melissa, my partners, um, was just kind of like, I think, I think you'll do it. You know, I, I think you, I think you're going to do it. And, uh, that meant a lot to me at that point in my life. You know, I didn't, I've, I've always had a few people in my corner, like really solid people who have believed in me, um, you know, friends, whatnot, not family or anything like that. But, um, to have, you know, somebody who, like he had, he had done, uh -huh. like to have, to have somebody, you know, who I didn't know that well, but also knew had, you know, been a successful person put a, you know, like to, to tell me that they believed in me and that they thought I could do it meant a lot to me at that point. And, you know, we always kind of kept loose touch. And in 2018, he asked me if I wanted to make wine from his vineyard up here because he had bought a couple of vineyards. And I was like, well, sure, but I need to see them. Um, and we flew up and right. drove out to the vineyard and I remember getting out of the car and just like being like, yep, this is it. This is, this is where I want to be. You know, I've always <laughs> been inspired by kind of extreme climates. I don't make a ton of white wine in California because I don't think the climate's right for it, but I drink more white wine than anything at home. And this is like a dream appellation or, you know, in particular the mountain I'm on for white wine. Um, and mm. I just, I was, you know, I, I was in love. I mean, I got out in the middle of this overgrown vineyard and looked across and Mount Hood just stares at you, you know, with all these pine trees around and, you know, it's, it's very uh, much an alpine yes. region, region, 1400 feet, volcanic soils, um, you know, uh, everything's dry farmed because we have considerable rainfall. Um, it's very unlike most yep. U.S. wine regions. Um, and I just, I fell in love. I made the wine, the wine, you know, the 2018 the wine I made came out beautifully. And, you know, once we got a little bit through in barrel, um, he and, he and his wife asked me if I wanted to, to partner and come up here and basically give, you know, gave me the opportunity to build, you know, the infrastructure, like farm, winery, vineyard, you know, single thread operation of my dreams. So that's what I'm up here doing. Um, you know, I'm building that's a winery fantastic. in the spring and we're looking into properties where we can, um, you know, either buy a space and, you know, refurbish it or, or build a space um, to have 
a, a you know kind of restaurant concept that would be mainly like a prefix meal a few nights a week with our wines and then you know maybe a somewhat of like a tasting room small snack option a couple days a week and then a soup kitchen a couple days a week um you know a big very important thing to me is you know having some type of food justice involved with whatever I'm doing, um, you know, as well as treating employees well. Um, I, I think that I'm going through a very strong kind of paradigm shift of, you know, in California, I tried to make really affordable, high quality wine. And I feel like I was able to do that, but at a loss only to myself where, you know, for the quality of wine, I think I've been making, I will, I sell it, I make a profit, but it's not, but for me to really grow that into something that would be, um, you know, like worth it, I guess, for all the hard work, I I would have had to get a lot bigger than I wanted to. And um, that's not what I wanted to do. So I, or, you know, what I decided I wanted to do. So for me, it's like, instead of trying to have this affordable product and, you know, create this equality in wine, which was a big principle for me, I mean, I, you know, I wanted to have wine that anybody could buy and, you know, it wouldn't break the bank and they could drink good wine and not have to worry about, you know, spending their whole paycheck. Um, Instead, I think I've come to the conclusion that the way that I can actually give back is, is much more simple. And it's, you know, by, you know, we dedicate a certain amount of time each week to, um, you know, to, to growing food and to having animals. And, you know, we have a free food stand at the bottom of the mountain that people can come get stuff from our farm from, or, you know, other people have started putting groceries and things from their farm on it, which has been wonderful. Um, You know, I'm working on setting up a temporary soup kitchen with a couple other businesses nearby, just mom and pop restaurant type businesses. Um, And then, you know, and then hopefully once we get our own space, we'll, we'll operate our own soup kitchen situation. And, you know, I'd love to have something where we can offer, you know, people who don't have food security, a beautiful meal here, here and there, you know, not just like ugly chili in a bowl, you know, in a styrofoam cup and, you know, a cup of orange juice, but, <laughs> you know, like, a. Uh, it's funny, you and I have so many similarities in the, the kind of things, the way that we think it's, it's, it's almost eerie, but I, I'm, <laughs> I mean, I've been struggling with the same, the same kind of conundrum of wanting to make wine from that perspective of like social equity, where, you know, it's affordable for anybody, especially because I believe in the values behind the wine, the organic viticulture, I want that to be accessible to everybody, not just to people in the upper middle class and above categories. Um, And yet, you and I both know the costs, especially at a small level of making wine, make that nearly impossible to to do all that and then still be able to have run a sustainable business, which if if we want to do good, that has to be part of it. We have to be able to survive and actually have a successful business. And I love your approach. I think that, you know, maybe the folk taking the focus away from the, the wine and what you can do around the wine and you know let the wine fund some of these other ventures is is actually a really great idea let me ask you some details about in um are you going to keep that name now that you've moved no 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 no. this is a completely different project i mean i'll probably keep making a small okay, amount of a- wine for Inconu in california but i'm you know i'm definitely not interested in having lar- a large production business in California while I'm doing this up here. You know, I, I'll mainly just make wine from vineyards how, that I lease and are being yeah. farmed the way I believe in. How big was your Incanu production, uh, you know? Um, how, or how big is it or was it I was at, at its five, biggest? 5,000 cases. Oh, that is very good size. I mean, in That's the great. grand scheme of things, it's not it's it, not huge. It's, it's still, a, still a boutique small winery. Right. 20,000 <laughs> 20, case boutique winery. Right. But uh, but no, I mean it's a it was a healthy size winery. It's what I wanted. It's what I wanted to get to. Yeah, no, that's yeah, that's my goal. I'm you know far below that, so that's why I think it's a good size. Um, why? What, what were the? What was your retail price for your bottles? Um, a lot of my wines were twenty one to twenty three dollars retail. Um, and then you know I had some that were around twenty eight. And then, um, you know, as I've been able to, yeah, that's great. 
gain a reputation and also realize that for fruit that I'm, you know, paying more money for and that I'm aging for longer, I, I had some wines that were um, in the $40, $50 range. And then what I will be doing is moving to having wines that are probably between $40 and $80 range, um, but only working with vineyards that I hold the lease on and I'm farming to my specs. Um, because I, because I don't, I don't, I actually, interestingly, like in most scenarios, don't believe that you can in particular in California make affordable wine, not to a loss of somebody, you know, like if you're really thinking about every step of the way, like somebody's losing for you to be able to have an affordable bottle of wine. Um, and I think that that's probably, yeah. if we, we if we really start thinking about how all employees are treated, be it, you know, who's picking your fruit or, you know, who's exchanging the posts in your vineyard or, yep. you know, who's putting, you know, stacking the boxes when you're bottling. If you, if you really start to think about that on a broad spectrum in Europe, it's probably just as bad if not maybe worse, like it's like, you know, there, there are, there are definitely wineries where there's affordable wine and, you know, sure no one's being abused, (laughs) but it's like, um, you know, are they actually being paid a livable wage and, you know, whatnot. And I think that unfortunately, frequently the answer to that is no on, on large scale projects. Yeah. I I mean, I'm, shocked you know if you move from a place like i i don't know exactly where you were getting your grapes but if you're you know if you move to like central valley california the the price is just like how is that even possible no i mean it's it's for, you know how terrible. do you even pay yeah yeah um yeah that's that's fascinating so one thing that we talked about was the fact that you pretty much were completely distributed, no direct to consumer sales mm-hmm. uh, for those five thousand cases. Is that right? Yeah, I mean, like very little. Like basically, somebody has to bother me for me to do DTC. Um, right, right, right. Hey, um, can I? I'll give you cash. Yeah, <laughs> and come to your house. Yeah, exactly. Um, That's yeah. yeah. So how, how? So how did you manage that? What was? How did you get that set up? And you know, what's the what's the secret to doing that? Because I want to do that. <laughs> um, I mean, you make a lot less money, but you also don't have to have as many em- right, employees. Right. You don't have to send out marketing emails all the time. You know, you're not as much a slave to being a salesperson. Granted, you do have to travel a lot and, you know, you have to meet your salespeople in different markets and build relationships. I mean, I think that that's like, like, this is going to sound so pompous and so nerdy, but I really like to play chess. Like, I love to play chess. Um, I hadn't played in years, actually, until very recently. And I've been playing, like, fanatically. Anybody who I can get to sit and play chess with me, I will play chess right now. You know, I used to, I used to play probably 10, 15 games a week when I was younger. Um, and uh, I think that business to me, like, the thing that I keep coming back to over and over again is that business is chess, not checkers. Like, you're not in a rush to do everything super quickly and get your pieces all over the board. It is strategic. It is slow. It is patient, you know, and I suppose that it's not like the, the place where it diverges from a chess analogy is that it shouldn't be adversarial. Um, you know, I think that it mm, is so right. we, we are a relationship business. Um, and yeah. not everybody has to like you, but it's important for people to respect you. So if you treat people respectfully, whether they're the CEO of a company or, you know, the person scrubbing the floors or doing the dishes at a restaurant and you treat everybody well and like a human and equally, and then you do business appropriately. Um, people like working with you, you know, even if it's difficult sometimes, and that relationship is frequently honored, not every single time, obviously. Um, but I have found that, if you build your alliances strategically, but with virtue, not just for marketing success. Manipulation. or Yeah, yeah exactly. I mean, it's like, like sometimes you have to break up with somebody who you really like, but it's just not going to work, you know? Yeah. Um, and you do that respectfully, you know, like there's people who I've professionally worked with that I don't work with anymore who are still confidants and good friends of mine. Um, and I think that that's to me more important to a certain degree than just like making a friend. Um, 
And that, I think, is how distribution has worked for me on a broad scale, is I've been able to build alliances and friend, you know, and really these are friendships, you know, and, and beyond friendships. I mean, one of the best pieces of advice I was given early on was actually from Steve Mathiason when I was talking about working with distributors. And, you know, I was having this big internal conflict over who I was going to pick to be my, my first distributor on the East Coast. And Steve told me that distributors are like marriages and you don't pick the person that you just want to hang out with. You pick the person who's going to like do a good job. You know, not, not that you don't want to hang out with the person you marry, but like, it, you know, <laughs> I was like, wait a minute, you, you don't, you don't, you don't marry the person who, you know, like you have the, the torrid, you know, you know, bottle throwing, fighting, screaming off balcony relationship with, or at least you shouldn't probably, you know, and it, but it may be fun, <laughs> right, right. you know, but, uh, but it's not, right. Yeah. And I think that that, you know, that was just a a really, really important thing for me to hear early on. Um, And I repeat that to myself all the time in business relationships. And, you know, I've had to leave a couple distributor relationships um, over the past uh, year and a half. But most of the ones that I've left and moved on from, you know, it's continued to be a good relationship. You know, there's been no hostility, nothing. Um, You know, that's not every single one, but, you know, it's just, you just like I think you just have to be cautious and you have to trust your gut and um and I don't know I mean I I think there's a certain level of 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 instinct that's required for any business any person who's doing business and if you don't have that instinct yeah you're probably not going to be a good business owner and you may be very good at helping somebody else with their business but to own a business and make big decisions on a regular basis. Like it has to come from like a weird place in your gut. Interesting. Okay. But yeah. I Let mean, me ask you a couple questions about that. So you, how many distributors does one have if you want to be national? Do you just need like a West coast distributor and an East coast distributor? How many do you work with? I think there's a work with thousand work ways with to skin a cat. Um, you know, I have gotten to a point where I had more distributors prior than I do right now, um, because it became more important for me to consolidate into people who I felt were easy maintenance relationships, um, Mm -hmm. but also who moved enough wine. So, you know, at some points I've like tried to have more and more and more, but like, then I realize I don't, I don't want more and more and more. I mean, most of my distributor relationships are on autopilot, you know, people re up on a regular basis. I actually don't send any pushy allocation emails. I don't send an allocation email actually at all. I, you know, when I'm releasing wine, I let people know how much wine I have and I sell it until it's gone. Um, when I need somebody to buy wine, you and know, I, I, I will occasionally be like, Hey, I need you to pick this up. Cause I need to sell it, but I try to just be as like hand hands off and, you know, commute, but communicative as I can. Like people don't like when you're pushy with them. Like, and usually people who respond yeah. to pushiness, like to people who are re- like somebody who's going to respond the way you want them to, to real pushiness is probably not a person that I want to work with either. Like I like working with people who are good at their jobs and who have good taste. And that's like a whole yeah. different thing. <laughs> Yeah. If that makes sense. So it's like, I don't have, I don't have a golden recipe. (laughs) Like I really don't, I, I don't know. I could like, I could, I could probably, probably have like 15 or something. Um, I also do a lot of business with, uh, the Montreal market. So through their SAQ and then I have a private importer I work with there. Um, you know, Quebec. How did you, how did you, how, how did you get started? Like what, what was your production when you got started and at what point did you start bringing on distributors um you know 12 i made a barrel of wine 13 i made like 350 cases 14 i made about a thousand cases and i didn't start selling wine until the very end of 2016 so um okay by the time i started selling wine i guess i had like you know you know 13 1400 cases of wine i was selling um but it, it was never hard for me to find distributors like i never I've never, like, I've actually only a few times in my life approached a distributor. Um, and it's mainly been to make a change okay. instead of finding somebody in a market. I mean, I, I believe, again, that, like, like to go back to a relationship analogy, 
in a position like a distributor or producer, you want your distributor to want to work with you. You don't want to ever be a burden to them. You don't want to ever be bothering them to sell your wine. And the best place for that relationship to start is by them coming to you and asking to work with your wine. Yeah. Or, you know, in the. How did you attract distributors? Then? Adam, I guess I'm just really cool. <laughs> I don't I have no idea. <laughs> it must be it. I mean, I made really good wine, I guess, that was affordable like in the beginning, or you know, I don't even know okay. if it was that. Yeah, like yeah. I don't even know if it was that. I think that I like it, it, it I don't I don't know what the, the recipe is. Well, how did they is. hear about you? Uh, I mean if you weren't selling wine, how did they hear about you? Through friends. I mean, you know, I again I think that personal okay. relationships are paramount. You know, like don't yeah, don't yeah, do, do okay. no harm you know like don't treat people like shit and <laughs> you know but but stand up for yourself absolutely. and stand up for other people i mean again it's not that there's definitely people out there i'm sure who don't like me but i think there's very few people out there who can say that i fucked them over and yeah. you know i and i also i like love love humans to death i mean you know i call like 30 different people my best friend and and that's sincere. Um, you know, I'm not necessarily good in crowds or groups, but I really, really, really cherish and enjoy cr- close relationships with people and, and have a hard time knowing people on a superfluous level. Um, so I think that's probably helped, um, you know, like having a good network of people who I sincerely care about and who sincerely care about me. And, you know, and I think the the wines, the wines are good. And even though they were clunky to a degree in the beginning, because I was a new winemaker, I think thankfully there was at least enough promise, you know, that they were going to eventually become great wines. And and I mean, I hope, I hope that I can achieve that at some point. Um, you know, I'm sure having good packaging helped at some point. I'm sure that I'm a lady. I hate to say it probably attracted some people towards me. Um, but I, yeah, I mean, I can't, I can't quant- I can't quantify it. I mean, I think that it's like there's no thing that you'd be able to point to and be like, that's why. It's just I, I think it, I was relentless. I know that. I wasn't giving up. Plenty of people, you know, early in my career tried to push me out and yeah, I, I, I don't I don't know. I mean, I just I wasn't okay. I wasn't I wasn't no, going good. anywhere. <laughs> Like not and not in the sense of like I wasn't <laughs> moving forward, but like I wasn't going to go away. Um, well, and then um, you know that's something that we no, all have to cool. remember well, is wine, good wine is good wine. Um, but at some point, you know, yeah. there's there's there is a storytelling element to wine, um, and this is something that you know again, fucking Steve Mathiason said this to me one day, and I thought because I was when I was telling him I was deleting my Instagram, and he's like, well, how are you going to tell your story? And I'm like, well. I don't know. <laughs> you know, I was like, oh, yeah, and I'm going to write a book with one of my friends. You know, he's like, oh, okay, there you go. You know, like, um, but, uh, but uh, you know, it's like, let's, like, like my icon, like, like if there was a, 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 a deity at the center of my temple of wine, it would be La Fou Bise Lerroi. I have only had her wine a handful of times. I have never met her. I've never watched an interview with her. I've never read anything about her. But there's just something about the way that woman lives in this world that I love. I just fucking love her. Like, I don't know. Like, I can only imagine how witty she is. I can only imagine how cutting she is. I can only imagine how amazing her collection of beautiful Hermes scarves are. But I guarantee you that you never, nobody has ever met her and forgotten about her. And I think that there's something about that that some mm. people have, and I don't know if I have it or not. <laughs> you know, I I know that I've definitely met other people <laughs> who do, um, and and I think that that is an energy that we can't quantify or explain. And I think that that if it carries over into your work as a creator of something, you know, it's it's a vibration. It's 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 a thing. It's like I. I don't know. I mean, I, you know, there, there's just people that you meet who, who make beautiful things and they, they amplify and, and carry that forward and who they are. Um, and that's like one of the wonderful mysteries of the world that I never want to understand. Like the day you tell me that there's like a gene or, you know, or a quantifiable 
entity that you can find that in another, you know, in a human, I'll, I will be devastated. I will be like, you just took magic away from me. You know, I think you have that. Well, I hope. I can't I wait so. to try <laughs> what you're... What, <laughs> what's what are you working on i mean what's the name that we should look for for your new project there up north um we are trying to get the name lorelei like the siren of the river rhine lorelei um, yes um oh, there's beautiful. a couple you're right other... on the river yes. yes it's very windy she killed sailors with her voice it's great um no uh but we'll we'll see um you know there's there's a few other businesses with that name and we'll be writing them letters to say we don't plan on interfering with your brewery or your beer bar but we really like that name (laughs) we'd like to share it with you (laughs) i love that name we have we have a wine called siren so oh cool that's awesome cool well i look forward to trying your wine adam um Um, Hey, I look forward to trying yours, Laura. Thank you. And I hope that was not too rambly. Oh, thank you. Yeah. uh, Not at all. Thank you for doing this. Look forward to connecting at some point.